and we are continuing looking at uh, Philippians. If you were here last week, you know that I waved the white flag. Um, I was going to do this, let's do a sermon for every chapter, completely failed. So now I'm trying my next tactic, which is try and do each chapter in two hits. And we'll see how far we get, because of course we come across these amazing uh, verses from Philippians chapter 2, where Paul has the wisdom to include an early Christian song into these verses. We're one of the best songs ever. And so the temptation was to dwell on that. You'll see that I'm not going to spend as much time as I should on it, because there's so much good stuff in it. So Father, as we read your word, we believe that your word is living, active, powerful, will challenge and transform us, will equip us and release us, will enable us to live the life you've called us to live. So open our minds to hear it, open our hearts to receive it, challenge our wills to live it out, we pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Please join with me. Therefore, if you have any encouragement for being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's a cracking song that, isn't it? Brilliantly written. So today, as I mentioned earlier on, I'm going to look at this topic of humility. It's a theme in this uh, early part of this chapter. And I think it's an undervalued virtue. I'll explain a little bit, hopefully, why that is the case as we go through this. Quickly, though, a reminder where we've been in chapter 1. Very quick overview. Paul is in prison again. This time it's not a dreadful prison like the one he was in when the church was established in Philippi. But he's still in prison chained to a Roman guard 24 hours a day, having to meet with the Caesar, which means he could have his head chopped off at any time, under death sentence, as it, uh, as it were, and yet he's full of joy. And yet, despite those miserable circumstances, he's full of joy. He's continued to tell people about the gospel, particularly those soldiers who are his captive audience. He's writing letters. He's praying for people. It's exactly what you wouldn't expect, but that's Paul, and that's the setting and now, having told that to the Philippians, his first chapter is effectively to say, I'm okay, guys. I'm rocking. He now begins to talk to them. And he gives them some very practical advice. Because there's a problem that has now hit the Philippian church. It's not a new problem. And in fact, I think it's a problem that every church has encountered. It's a lack of humility. Or to put it another way, pride. Pride has hit the church. It's the downfall of so many churches. It's probably the root cause of why churches, in the end, fall apart. Pride, which says, I know better than you. I know my way or the highway. And churches divide over it and get all over the place about it. And we stand and stand firm and say, nothing will shake me from my position. And therefore, the church falls apart. Now, I'm not saying that we should be so woolly and wussy that we don't have anything to stand for. If we don't believe what we believe, we'll just fall over at the first breath of wind. But there is also a place where we have to learn to say, actually, this is important. This is of primary importance, and this is of secondary or tertiary importance, and not worth falling out about, not worth losing the plot over. Churches, on the main, have a massive weakness. This is how the, actually the, the world sees us. They say, you're great, but you have this massive weakness. You open your doors at your public services, like today on a Sunday, and you let anyone in. 
That's your weakness. I mean, look around you. Let anybody in. We don't have a criteria. We don't say, if you want to be part of this club, you've got to be that wealthy or, or look this way or have this education or, or have this knowledge or experience this or do whatever. We say there's no criteria. Just walk in. Be part of what we're doing. And that's a huge weakness because if you let anybody in, they come in with all their rubbish. They come with all their misunderstandings. They come with all their stuff because Jesus accepts us just as we are. He doesn't intend to leave us as we are. That's part of what people forget. He'll take you as you are. He took me as I was and completely I was like a basket case. So ask, ask anyone back those days. I just lived for the next pint, frankly. Um, he took me as I was, but praise God, didn't leave me as I was. But we let people come in, and when they come in, they come with all their nonsense. We can be a very disparate group of people, actually a desperate group of people as well, but I did use the word disparate on purpose. Very varied bunch of people. And because of that, it's amazing that we can have one cohesive vision, one decision where we're going. It happens because, of course, we are united in more than we're different. We're united in Jesus Christ. We're united in our passion for the gospel. That's what Paul said. You remember in chapter 1, he said, I've got two things I focus on more than anything else, on Jesus and the gospel. And if we unite around Jesus and the gospel, then the things that make us different actually become far less important and far greater the things that unite us and these positive things. Christian maturity, however, because this is what it takes to be a mature Christian, is to learn to know what is important and what isn't. Christian maturity is indelibly linked with humility. They go together. But what I've discovered, as now there are probably more years behind me than ahead of me, I have discovered that maturity is not a factor of age. I so wish it was, but it isn't. There are plenty of people who are older in their years who, frankly, are utterly immature and totally full of pride. There are quite a few people, and this is a wonderful sight, who are young in years, who are very mature in Christ, and who are very humble. Likewise, Christianity is not a fact of how long you've followed Jesus. Some people will say, well, I followed Jesus for 40 years. Yep. But are you actually full of the Spirit? Have you allowed Him to grow the fruit of maturity in your life? Or are you just going on about the fact that you've turned up for church for 40 years, but you've still got the same ornery, difficult, arrogant, angry, unforgiving spirit? If that's the case, you are immature. That's not good. So we have to understand that when Paul is talking about humility, he's in the same breath saying maturity. We need to grow up in the Lord. And remind ourselves what most of us would know, I hope, is that pride was the, that was the main sin of Satan, as it were. It's what ha made him fall. We, we read in Scripture, he was one of the greatest angels, and yet he began to think that he was worthy of the worship that only God should receive. He thought he was equal, maybe even superior to God, and then he found out that he wasn't. Because no created being comes anywhere near the Creator. He's infinitely greater, and so Satan is cast out of heaven. That was his fall, but he realizes that he can still use the same tactic with us. And so pride is how he manages to get into churches and into families and into our lives to pull us apart. It's that phrase you've got up there, it's a very obvious phrase, united in Christ, we can stand firm. But if we are divided, we'll be easily picked off. Another term for pride is false humility. And it, you want me personal, your pride is obvious in one sense. You can see it a mile off. You might not like it, but at least you know it. False humility, I find cringeworthy. I find it sickening, personally. It's manipulative. It's about flattery. It's about saying all the things. And you know that they're just sugarcoating it, and it leaves this uh, on your mouth, doesn't it? So personally, if you want to really wind me up, be, be falsely humble, you know? And I'm like, ah, you know, I much prefer someone to be straight up proud, frankly, know what I'm dealing with. But all this fancy, la -dee da stuff, and you know behind it, there's a proud person who's just trying to, you know, butter you up and say something. Oh, horrible. Now, the reason I hate it so much, 
let's be cards on the table because I've lived that way. Okay, so look in the mirror, Peter. That's what I'm really saying is I know that I've lived that way. I know that I've manipulated people. I know that I've flattered people to get my way. And afterwards, I felt that horrible taste in my mouth too. And you know, at the end of the day, it just doesn't work because if you build something which is false, it has no structure, it's got no foundation. It falls apart anyway. And you know in your back of your mind, I only got that job, I only got that sale, I only got that, that thing because I arm twisted them, I manipulated them, I was false about it. And there's a sense that it's just, it's not genuine, it's not authentic, and it can't last. How does Satan deafen proud people? I was asking myself that, this question. I was up at camp trying to write this talk at the same time. It's actually rather difficult because I'm giving a talk every day and uh, twice on Fridays as they do and all these other things going on and I'm trying to focus on completely different topics what I was preaching on this morning. But I was like, how do you deafen people? I mean, if you've been around church circles for a while, for, for example, you'll hear this sort of teaching. It won't maybe as, as straight up as this one on humility this morning, but you'll hear it, so how come you don't respond to it? How can you hear? And I ask myself, it's the same as, you know, how do people who refuse to forgive not hear the teaching that says, if you don't forgive someone, you're poisoning yourself. You think you're actually beating them up. Well, maybe, but you're the victim. You're the one who's going to have a ruined life. And I said, well, why do people get that? Well, Satan deafens people because they're convinced, I put up there, they're convinced they're right, they're in the right, they have the right to do, to say, to think, to plan, to connive, to do whatever they want. They're utterly convinced they're right. And if you're completely convinced you're right, then you think, I can have it my way. Now, that's called deception, isn't it? And if you're deceived, you don't know. That's the point of deception. If you know that you're deceived, then you're no longer being fooled by it, you're just an idiot. Okay? I know this is wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. That's just foolishness. But deception's much more insidious, isn't it? Deception is a lie that you believe to be true. And then you live it out confident that you're right. And that, by the way, is the heart of what we call Jesus' ministry. If you're new here, and I'm going to be teaching about Jesus' ministry in the fall, that's the heart of it. We believe the lie. The lie, by the way, is Satan's greatest weapon. He was destroyed on the cross. He's just left with lying. It's what he started with in the Garden of Eden with, with our spiritual ancestors, Adam and Eve. He lied to, to them. And the lie is what he's left with. He's the father of lies. He has mastered lying. And we can be deceived by that. And if you have that wrong thinking in your mind, it will lead to your wrong values, which lead to your wrong beliefs. Belief means be my life, which is then manifested in your words, your actions, your habits, and your behavior. But it all starts with the wrong belief, the wrong understanding. So that's how he deafens proud people. And indeed, any other factor, he, you actually believe you're right. And therefore, you think you can stand firm. Now, Paul has taught the Philippians well. He said, guys, your primary focus is Jesus. Your priority is sharing the gospel. That's it, guys. That's our priority. And he's told them the unifying truth is equality before Christ. And I think, again, this is how we stop pride coming in is to recognize that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. To recognize that every single person, bar none, needs a savior, cannot save themselves. Some of us might think that we were better than others, but the fact is it's only by a small degree compared to what Jesus had to do for us, how far we are away from the perfection of Jesus Christ. And I used this illustration this week. I'm going to go off topic now, but I, I was really struck by this. Um, if you read uh, the, the prophet Zechariah, he has a vision. He's taken uh, into the uh, temple of God in Jerusalem on the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, as it's called today. And that's the day, that the, the only day in the Jewish scriptures where the Jews had to fast. It's a really important day when sacrifices are made for the sins of the whole nation. And they have this one representative, the high priest. And he has got to be the, the, the best that humanity can provide. Because he's representing the whole nation. And so if you know a bit of a history of what's happened before Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the high priest would be secluded for a whole week. They put him in, in isolation for a week. So he can't touch anything unclean, can't meet anyone who is impure. 
and he'll be given baths, and he shaves off every hair on his head, so there's no, no uncleanness about him, and every hair on his body, and he'll bathe again, and they'll give him this clean clothes, the best, cleanest clothes that he could possibly wear. And when the Day of Atonement comes, he is there representing people. The people are watching him. And he'll kill the first animal, the sin offering. And they're going, right. And as soon as that sin offering is killed, which is the, the, the offering for the wrong relationship of all people, that animal dies because the wage of sin is death. He then gets washed again. And there's a sort of a little curtain which is sort of, they can see through it. They can't really see it, but they can see the shadow of him. So they see him washing, and they're cheering him on because he's their representative. And he's getting clean. He's getting clean again. And he puts another set of clean robes on. And then he'll pray over this scapegoat, the one that's going to be led off. So they see their sins, different to sin, remember, sins being removed. And they're so pleased that it's happened because God says, I remove your sins. And guess what happens? He has another wash and another set of clothing. And then he goes into the Holy of Holies, into the inner, inner, inner sanctum that only one person, the high priest, can go into only once a year. That is the place where God dwells, the holy place. And you go in there when you shouldn't go in there and you're toast, you're dead meat. He goes in with bells on these robes so they can hear him moving around. They know he's still alive. He goes in with a rope around him so that if he were to die or faint or whatever, they can pull him out without going in there. He goes into this place, the cleanest human being around, the one who's been prayed for, the whole nation has prayed for him, the one who's bathed more times than we can count, the one who's got the cleanest robes on. He goes into that place to do the final acts of sacrifice before the holy God. And Zechariah in his vision sees Joshua, who at that point is the high priest, having gone through all of that. And if you know the book, you know what he sees. What does he see? He sees Joshua, and Joshua is filthy. He's filthy. His robes are disgusting. He is unclean. And Zechariah is shocked. How could the people let the high priest go into the Holy of Holies at any point, but on the Day of Atonement, filthy? Well, the fact is they hadn't, but humanity's best effort. We saw him going in there. They saw him going in there and said, that's our man. He's the cleanest we've got. He's the best we've got. They're cheering him in. And now Zechariah gets to see the high priest Joshua with the eyes of God himself. And God says, this is what I see, the very best that humanity can offer, and it's disgusting. And then the great words of God, when he says, now give him clean clothes. And Joshua is clothed in clean clothes, clothed by God, not by human beings. And Zechariah's prophecy is showing to us, no matter how good you think you are, no matter how well you think you've done, it is filthy before God. But that's not the end of the story. Because when you acknowledge that, then the Father says, now give her clean clothes. The Father says, now dress him and clean him up. And we need to understand, therefore, that we're all in that filthy place and I don't give a rip whether you know you're that much better than me, because in comparison to what it should be, it is just not important. We're all down there. And once we get that message and we understand it, then we see how in the family of the Father, those who've accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior and their Lord, now we don't look at each other as if to say, I'm better than you. Well, that's rubbish, isn't it? That's why that, that wonderful definition of those who share the gospel is this. It's like one beggar showing another beggar where to find food. There's no arrogance in that. It just says, look, we've got some food, and this is how you're going to have some too. And Paul is saying to the Philippians, I need you to get this. I need you to understand this is how my church operates, the church of Jesus Christ. Because if you operate that way, then pride is, is just horrible, and everyone can spot it a mile off. And we stay united in Jesus Christ. But sadly, some have forgotten that. And they get caught up in their own agenda, their own vision. If that happens, it leads to what is called division. The word division means die, means two, two visions. And you end up going different directions. 
and it's horrible, okay? They think they're more important than others. They want their rights. That's a great phrase of our country, isn't it? I want my rights. It destroys the church because the root of it all is pride. So Paul wants to say, well, the antidote to pride is humility. That's the antidote. And humility is a quintessentially Christian virtue. In case, again, you're not aware of what things were like 2,000 years ago, possibly not because we weren't around then. Um, about 2,000 years ago, humility was not seen as a virtue. Okay, humility was seen as a, a weakness. They did not clap people who were humble. They ignored them, trampled on them, and said, what are you thinking? Okay, what was seen as a virtue in those days were people who were proud, people who knew what they were doing, people who took things by force, people who were confident in how they lived. But humble people, uh-uh. And that was the way that they thought. That was Greek thinking. That was Roman thinking. That was the way that it was thought in those days. And then Jesus turns up, who is the God, King of all. There's his throne, just to remind you, still behind me. So where's God coming? If, if I was God, this is their thinking, I'm going to rule, I'm going to reign, and you're going to do my, th- my, my bidding. And what does Jesus say? Matthew 20, verse 28, he says, The Son of Man, so tightly gave to himself, did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus turns everything upside down. He says, I didn't come to be served. I came to take off my outer robe and wash your feet. The most disgusting, menial job that a servant did. And they couldn't get their head around it. But after the crucifixion and after the resurrection and the ascension, when the Spirit of God came upon those disciples, and even before that point, I mean, the last question the disciples asked Jesus in Acts chapter 1 is, are you going to establish the kingdom now? Here, and can we still be on your right and left and rule everywhere? (sighs) The last hair gets plucked out of Jesus' bald head. They didn't get it, did they? But when the Spirit came, they got it. And then the Christians, the followers of Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, began to live lives that were humble, and it turned the world upside down. They began to serve people. They began to care about people. In those days, if you were a Roman father, for example, your lord of your family, your your wife gave birth, the, the, the baby would be put at your feet. This little baby, hours old. And they would look at you, and if you went like that, baby dies. Okay, that's the way it goes. So guaranteed that if the baby is born disabled, gone. They'd probably just throw you into the Tiber River. Nice, easy, quick disposal. Often happened if the baby was female. Don't need one of those. They would be put out on the streets, picked up by somebody who would raise them to be a prostitute most of the time. That was going to be their life. That's the power that was there. And then the Christians come in and they say, no, we value people. We love people. And they began to care for the disabled. And they began to recognize that women were equal with men. And they began to invest in that. And when people were sick, they didn't abandon them. They went into those places, daring that they might actually get those sicknesses because they cared. And because Christianity has invaded into the West, although we've now walked away from it so much, it is the bedrock of what we believe. That's why if I was to stand up in this uh, province of ours, in this country of ours, which is walking away from Jesus, and said, no, I think we should go back to Roman times, pre-Christian times, but they didn't really follow that, and I think we should top every disabled kid, uh, disabled kid let's kill them, every disabled person, forget with their kid, if we let them grow up, every woman, they can go off, I'd be like, I'd be meat, wouldn't I? I mean, I'd be dead. And I'd say, well, why do you think that way? The only reason you think that way is because Jesus came and lived that life and showed us this is the way to live. So you might walk away from Jesus. You might walk away from his teaching. But the fact is, his teaching has got you. And you understand it to be truth. And we live it out because we know this is the right way it should be. Okay, so this is, it's a Christian virtue. It is not present in any other religion or place. It's now seeped into those places. But it's actually started with Jesus Christ. The other thing with humility is it's impossible to know if you are humble. That's a real bummer, that, isn't it? Because the moment you think you're humble, you're obviously not. Okay? You have to wait till someone else says, I think you're humble. But don't listen too loudly because then you'll get a big head. Now, fortunately for you, I've actually written a book about this because I thought it's so important. So I wrote a book about it called Humility and How I Achieved It in Five Steps. 
I've got a number of hardback copies signed already for you. If you'd like to take them home, put them prominently on a coffee table, uh, announce them, get them out as much as possible. I need the royalties. Um, pick them up later. Go on, somebody go and ask me for a copy after the service. It'll make me laugh. How does Paul administer the humility antidote? He needs to alert them to the danger. He needs to say to them, so he appeals to them as followers of Jesus. He appeals to them to refocus, to remember what they owe to Jesus. And he does this, verse 1, with four ifs. You thought, I'm never going to get to the passage, didn't you? See, that's my trouble trying to do a whole chapter. I couldn't do it in one hit. I can barely do one verse. Here we are. Four ifs in verse 1. Just to remind you, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, if you have those things, then, verse 2, then something happens. It's a classic if-then statement. Often the Bible will get God saying, if you did this, then I promise to do that. This is a different way of approaching. He's saying, if you live this way, then this will be the consequence of it. But if you don't live this way, then this is the consequence of it. So we're seeing actually Paul just laying it out, saying very clearly, you decide which way you're living, but there are consequences either way to how you live. So let's look at them. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ. That means if you have any encouragement from being a follower of Jesus, knowing that you're in Christ and saved. I don't want false smiles here, but you see, the fact of what he's really saying is, does grace still make you gobsmacked? Does grace still float your boat? Does grace mean you go, yes, it's amazing? Does grace make you go, I can't believe it. It is utterly incredible. It's outrageous. It's amazing. It's fantastic. Does grace do that for you? And likewise, does being a forgiven child of the Father no, not only that you're forgiven, but you're the child, the son or the daughter of the father with access to him at any time. Does that still blow your socks off? Is it something you still say uh, every morning, I can't believe this privilege to so you come into his presence knowing that you can and take advantage of that continuously? Because that's what he's saying. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, you see, if you've lost that wonder, if you don't want to joyfully praise God because, frankly, it's, it's so last year, it's so what it was, if you aren't thankful for forgiveness, yeah, it's great, but yeah, blah, blah, blah. If you're no longer encouraged that knowing God is always for you, it doesn't now do much for you. It's just become routine. It's background noise. If you find it all rather samey, boring, truthfully, you know, you drag yourself out of bed, but honestly, I'm here out of duty rather than joy. If you have no desire to make Jesus known, if you have no desire to tell people about Jesus Christ, well then, then what you've done is you let something else take the place of Jesus. You've got another vision, another agenda, you're following another God. I can't sugar the pill any other way. Don't kid yourself that all's right with the world. You've lost the joy. You've lost what it's about. Second, if any comfort from his love, are you open to his love? to flow into you and then through you to others. Uh, God's love is freely available. And one of my favorite verses, you hear me quote it all the time, Romans 5, verse 5. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he's given to us. God, the Holy Spirit, pours out love into us. He's not holding back. But do you have any comfort from that? You see, God's inflowing love gives us the three things we look for, state of significance and self-worth. We need that in order to, to live confidently. If you don't receive those things from God, you'll try and get them from someone else. That's what idol worship is. That's what the frantic nature of our world is. But God's outflowing love, he's saying, I want you to receive, and then I want you to pour it out. You, you receive to get. You, you receive to give. You receive to give. You receive to give. You give to get, to give, to get, to give, to get, to give, to get, to give. That's what it's all about. And if you have that, you can... Bring comfort to the hurting and the insecure and the weak and the lonely and the lost and the frightened and the failure and the least and the marginalized. That's what we're called to be like. But you can't do it in your own strength. You'll run out. You'll tire out. You'll burn out. But in the love of God, you can. Third, if you have any common sharing in the Spirit, any fellowship with God, any desire to walk constantly with Him, that picture of our spiritual parents in Eden, Walking with God. A great verse in, in there, Galatians chapter 5, 25, where Paul says, keep in step with the Spirit. He actually says there are some that run ahead of the Spirit. 
that's not good. There's some who lag behind, that's not good either. There's some who are walking with the Spirit, but everyone else steps off with the right foot, but you have to go with your left. That's not good. He says, keep in step with the Spirit. Let your heart beat in time with His heart. See what the Spirit is saying. That means, of course, if you're not asking the Father to fill you with His Spirit, you're relying on your own resources. And you go back to your own efforts, and then you claim it was all by you, and that's the open door to pride. Fourth, if any tenderness and compassion. The word compassion used there is a, a word that was used for a, a woman who was about to give birth. And she felt this stirring in her womb and love for this unborn child. And if you've been, all your mums here, that's what you felt. That's why, how do you, I mean, I remember when Kezia was born particularly, and there's Margaret going through blooming agony as Kezia uh, is born. And I'm going like, whoa, if it was me, I'd have a few words to say to this kid for that pain. And literally moments later, there's Kezia just resting on top of Margaret. Margaret's going, my beautiful baby. And I'm like, how does that work? <laughs> That's just odd, you know? Looks like Winston Churchill anyway, but all babies look that way. But, you know, that's the, if you have any stirring. Matthew chapter 9, Jesus is exhausted. Jesus has given everything he's got. Jesus is knackered. He wants a break, but he looks out and he sees the crowd. And the crowd are like sheep without a shepherd. And something stirs him, and we read, he was moved by compassion. And he goes and he teaches more, and he heals them, and he cares for them. That's the heart that Paul's talking about. If you're not stirred about hell, because hell is real. I wish it wasn't, but it is. And if you're not stirred that people are going to spend eternity there, then what does stir you? If you're not stirred that there are unevangelized people in this country, let alone across the globe, and you're not saying, I've got to get the gospel to them so they can spend an eternity with the Father. If that doesn't stir you, are you stirred by the sick, by the needy, by the hungry, by the lost, by the last, by the least? If you're not stirred, and I, I think you, you, you've gone dead. Your heart's gone cold. You're not a gender. You, you're self-absorbed. And that's unfortunately what the church has become. That's why we seem to be irrelevant. But it shouldn't stay that way. Ezekiel 36, verse 26, God says, I'm going to give you a new heart, put a new spirit in you. I'm going to change things. And that's what God's doing in all of us. He's like, I've got something better. Now, if we can say yes to all those ifs of verse 1, then we're challenged to be like-minded, of one spirit, one mind, unite behind the common goal. Just to remind you, when you, anyone remember the Lord's Prayer? Some of you remember it. Matthew 6, Luke 11, the first thing that we're told to pray about, we're told to recognize God is our Father, that He's our Father, that He's in heaven, that He's holy. The first prayer request is this one, to see the Father's kingdom come here on earth as already risen in heaven. That's the most important thing we pray for. That's why Jesus put it first. We want to pray for our own needs and what we want, but He said, first of all, pray the Father's kingdom. Pray that Dad's kingdom comes. And that means that we push back the kingdom of Satan, back the kingdom of darkness, back the kingdom of death. And we pray the Father's kingdom comes. That's what it means to be like-minded, together with one vision for this. And Paul said, you know, if you have that attitude, my joy is complete. Remember, he gets his joy from outside himself. And the Father says to us, if you have that attitude, then my joy is complete. And he does more than that. He says, from Psalm 133, verse 3, I will command a blessing. I will command from heaven when I see my people united in that common vision. I will say from heaven, bless that lot. Bless them. Bless them more. Isn't that great? I don't know how he'll bless us, but it's going to be good because blessings are good. We achieve this because we have the same love. Do you see that? The same love comes from the Spirit we've already seen. We love God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, John 14, verse 15, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. So we're not going to live outward outflow of that love is going to be obedience and we love as the father loves for the last the lost and the least now it does tell us in verse 3 there are a couple of things to avoid selfish ambition it's all about me okay that's not good avoid that instead have godly ambition i don't want you to avoid ambition ambition's good really good 
Jesus was very ambitious. He said, I'm going to save the world on the cross. But let's make sure that it's godly. It's for the kingdom. Okay? The second thing to avoid is vain conceit. Vain conceit says, I know best. It's back to pride again, isn't it? I know better than God's word. I know better than, than God himself. I know best. So now finally Paul's ready to administer the antidote to pride, humility. And a very hard statement here. Value others above yourself. Consider others better than yourself. Now let's just be clear what that doesn't mean. Okay? That doesn't mean that we go into false humility. Doesn't mean that we all suddenly say, well, yes, you are. You're much better than me. Or you're much more than me. That's just nonsense, all right? There are some people who are clearly have gifted in ways that are much better than I am. And I'm not going to expect Tim to come to me and say, well, actually, Peter, you're a much better singer than I am and a much better piano player than I am. That's just silly, okay? So that doesn't mean that. That's where people get off track again. That's just bonkers, and we all know it is. He doesn't say that. He says, value them. Value them. Put their interests before yours. Now, any parent knows that has to be the case. If you decide your interest goes before your baby, you'd never change a diaper. Okay? You never do anything. So everybody knows that works, but this is how we're supposed to live our life. I want to value you. And that doesn't not about gifting, it's not about anything like that. It's about the person. Okay? So we die to self-interest. I really like this two-liner. It takes more grace than I can tell to play the second fiddle well. I used to have a friend who was a violinist in an orchestra. And she was never going to be the lead violin, the one who gets all the planes and whatever, just in the orchestra. And she used to say, it's really hard every night to put everything I've got into it when I know there's another 20 people also playing the same tune. It's probably obvious if I play a different one, but really go for it every night. That's hard. But I choose to do it, she said, not for myself, actually not for the audience, not for the other violin players, but I do it for Jesus. And every night I'm playing my violin for Jesus. She said, I play my very best. Why aren't we humble? <laughs> I think the key reason why people are humble is because they're afraid. I think fear is the reason we're not humble. We're afraid of being taken advantage of. We're afraid of not, we won't get what we need or want. And I think that's very understandable. But that's why Paul starts in verse 1 to say, look, the things you need, your status, your self-worth, your security, if you find your identity in Christ, in God, then you don't need to be afraid for those things because he'll give them to us. Okay? So, verse 4, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others, valuing others. So we start off with Jesus-centered, then we become other-centered, you see, each of us, no exceptions. And so we pray. And when I was a very new Christian, it's an old chest, not this, but no harm in it. I was taught to pray joy. Pray Jesus first, then pray for others, and then pray for yourself. J-O-Y. Now, please don't forget the why. There's some silliness out there that says, oh, you don't have to pray for yourself. Of course you do. Of course you do. But sometimes it's very healthy to put your best into other people first. Praying for others first. And we follow Jesus. His entire mission was self-denial. He obeyed the Father. He gave, gave, gave. And so we read in verse 5, in relationship with others, we must have the same mindset or the same attitude as Jesus, which means we've got to give, give, give. Our churches are full of consumers. In fact, our society is full of consumers. My rights, my things, uh, it's a sort of entitlement generation. But the church can be one of the worst places. People rock up and they judge the church by what programs can be given to them. I want to check the children's stuff is good for my children and the sermons are really worth listening to and the band's any good and I'm going to consume. And if it doesn't reach and, and, and meet what I want, I'll go and find another church. That's not the church, okay? It's a, a Western invention, but it's not the church. And if you're going to do that, you haven't got the understanding of what Jesus is talking about. He's saying you've got to be contributors. You learn more and you grow more and you enjoy more when you get in there and make a difference. All right? That's what Jesus' point. He could have stayed in heaven and looked down on us, but he got involved and he contributed even to his own life. Now, he set the bar high, didn't he? Our attitude, our mindset like Jesus. Why was it so high? Well, because God is perfect, so he couldn't do anything less than that. Number one, but secondly, we need to understand Jesus was fully human, 
full of the Holy Spirit, which means that he's showing us this is how you live your life. Jesus only ministered in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so he says to us, you, the Jesus follower, you get full of the Spirit. Now, Jesus did have some advantages over us, didn't he? He never sinned. Therefore, he has no guilt. He didn't have to deal with that. So I'm not saying that because Jesus was perfect, we're expected to be perfect. We're not going to be perfect. We can't be perfect. We're still works in progress. We won't be perfect this side of heaven. But he doesn't say that. He says, make your attitude, your mindset be this way. That's what our, our hope is. That's what we set the bar at because we're aiming high. And even though we're going to fail and fall short, and that's when we say, Dad, forgive us, we're not going to stop because we're aiming high. We're not content with something that is less than what Jesus said. Okay, so our, our attitude will differ from reality. We're going to first put our hands up about that, but it doesn't mean to say we won't aim for the best. So for Jesus, the way up is to descend. We need to understand that. This is the attitude. For Jesus to be humbled is to be exalted. That was his attitude, his mindset. For Jesus to be first is to choose to be last. How different to our society. For Jesus to be the servant is to be the master. Most of us just want to get to the top of the greasy poles where other people do the job for us. He says no. For Jesus to, to defeat the power of evil and Satan is to be loving and selfless. For Jesus to endure death is to receive the title, the Lord of Life. Do you see how it's utterly opposite? It's the upside down kingdom values that are the only way to live life. So from this early Christian song, we see what is called the greatest nosedive in history. From God to man, huge step down. But not content with that, it went from man to servant, or indeed, more literally, slave. And from slave to criminal, and from criminal to death. The greatest nosedive in history is what God himself chose to do. He went from being eternal to being mortal, from being universal to being local, from being in heaven to being on earth, from being the sovereign ruler to being subject to others. That's what this song is saying. And he's saying your attitude, your mindset has got to be the same as Jesus Christ. Talk about going against the grain. Talk about cutting against the crowd. Talk about standing against the flow. This is what Jesus is saying. And what we see in verse 6 is that God chose to submit to God. Jesus, who was equal with the Father, Jesus equal with the Spirit, but voluntarily chose to submit. It took humility. He made himself nothing. It doesn't get smaller than that, does it? to become nothing. He abandoned his rights and was treated like a slave. He let people walk all over him. He allowed false accusations. He, he never spoke up. You know, in his trial, he didn't say a word. He let them do what they wanted to do. And we go, I don't want to be abused, but our master was. Our master had that attitude. How could he do it? Because he said yes to the ifs in verse 1. That's how he lived. His status, his significance, his self-worth was found in the Father. And so he could give and give and give. That's how he lived. There was no division between the Father's vision and his. That's why he could say, not my will but yours. Your will be done. And so he gave his life. And the result is Jesus is exalted to the highest place. The, the second part of the song just lifts the roof off, doesn't it? He's given a name above every name. That's why we always talk about the name of Jesus. It's by Jesus' name and Jesus' name alone that people are saved. Every knee will bow before him and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and it's all to the Father's glory. Hallelujah. Just uh, three quick things and I'm going to finish. And they are quick. First, to understand in those days that they understood what it was meant to, to kneel before somebody. You knelt before the emperor. Caesar, they said, was God. And you either willingly knelt before him because you're a Roman citizen, you understood that, or you were unwillingly there because you were a slave. And you were told to go there. That was the first thing. They understood that. But Jesus is infinitely greater. And he says, you get to choose. You can voluntarily bow before me, or one day you will compulsorily bow. My personal belief, could be wrong, is that when we come face to face with Jesus, as every one of us will do so, we will all be flat on our face. That's the only place you're going to be in front of God. But for those who know him as Savior and Lord, I think he will pick us up 
and draw us to himself and look us in the eye and welcome us as his friend. But for those who refused him, then he'll be the judge. I think with tears in his eyes, actually, but he's the judge and he will give to them what they have already wanted, which is to have nothing to do with him. That is hell. Second vindication. Most people want to be vindicated, correct? And the great news is that Jesus was totally vindicated. So much fun to be able to say, I told you so. I was right. Okay? And since Jesus represents humanity, it's reasonable to presume that his followers will be vindicated too. The bad news. Okay? The bad news is Jesus was vindicated after his death. Okay? His vindication came at the uh, resurrection. That's what proved that he was right. So you can guess when our vindication is going to come. And if you are looking for vindication in this life, I think you're going to be very frustrated. Okay? It ain't going to happen. But don't worry. You'll get it in the next life when it won't matter. (laughs) So there goes vindication. In the end, it's not universal salvation. It's universal confession. That's what we get. One day, everyone will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And third and finally, it's all about the glory going to the Father. I couldn't let this one just go by. It's all about the Father's glory. Remember what Jesus said in John 17? I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Jesus said it's all about my Father's glory. That's what we're about too. So Jesus gave his life to save humanity. The challenge we're facing is what will you give? What are you willing to give? Will pride, will false humility continue to rule and reign and ruin in your life? Or will you imitate Jesus' mindset? Will you dare to risk all in the costly act of humility for the Father's glory? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you again for sending your Son. Thank you for your patience. Thank you that you didn't write us off. Thank you that you planned for us to be reconciled back to yourself. Jesus, we are so grateful that you are Lord as well as Savior. We see what you're willing to go through for us, that you became nothing. You left the luxury of heaven for a borrowed manger. You came and lived amongst us so that you could take our place on the cross. You lived the life we should have lived. You died the death we should have died so that we could be reconciled to your Father. Holy Spirit, we pray now that you would fill us with your love and you would show the lies in our life that have caused us to be proud and instead give us that desire to be humble, knowing that that is the way that brings to life, leads to life and will bring not just life to ourselves but life to everyone with whom we meet. Come, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.